There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know it is the spirit of the Lord. I want to talk for the time that's mine from this subject. It's time for the church to be the church. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of your grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, precious Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Now, God, allow the words of my mouth and the very meditations of my heart to be found acceptable in thy sight. Speak, O Lord, to the end that your people are edified and you are glorified. May we continue to be transformed by your presence and by your power. It's in the only name that matters, the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, we, when there is so much confusion regarding lifestyles, organizations, governments, policies, both social and political, and yes, even some confusion regarding what is appropriate for church. I submit to you that it's time for the church to be the church. There's much conversation regarding same-sex marriage, transgender persons, corruption in business and politics, all of which I will say are hot button and controversial issues. The only institution that God has sent forth to speak to the chaos in our lives is the church. The church is not called to be just another social club, a gathering where people meet, talk, eat, and nothing changes with the individuals who make up the community of faith and the community which the church is called to serve. God has empowered the church to be the change agent in the community, the nation, and the world. One day when Jesus was walking along after having taught his disciples, after he had healed the sick, opened up blinded eyes, caused the lame to walk, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? It's amazing when you ask people a question they'll respond for someone else. They won't tell you what they think. They'll tell you what somebody else thinks. It was true then and it's true now. And they said, some say. There's always some say. Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elias, and other Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. Jesus now speaks directly to them Sometimes you want to know what people close up to you think. And he said, whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, thou art Peter. And upon this rock, not upon Peter, but upon the faith that Peter and people like Peter had to know that he was the son of God. He says, upon this foundation, I'm going to build my church. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth, I'll bind on earth. And whatsoever you loose on earth, I will loose in heaven. And then the church is the only institution that really has the truth. We know that we don't have the whole truth because the truth really rests in Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Jesus talks and says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. 
Whether I go, ye know, and the way you know. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Here's the answer for someone who is struggling as to which way to go and how to get there. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to know which way to go, you have to walk with J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. Well, Pastor, we're called to be the church. How can the church really be the church, the called out body, the ecclesia that we're called to be? I believe that a blueprint to this question can be found in, in what is called the pastoral epistles, which are penned by the Apostle Paul. The pastoral epistles were written to the church, to the pastors, so that they could know how things are to operate in the household of faith. If you're taking notes and you've been to seminary, then you know that the pastoral epistles are 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Both Timothy and Titus were students and mentees of the Apostle Paul. And Paul writes to them to give them instructions as to how the church of God should be governed and what should happen in the house of faith. In his letter, you know, to Timothy, which was his adopted beloved son, he gives instructions for worship, for the role of the pastor, and for deacons in the church, and charges Timothy to be faithful to the call of God on his life. Titus, whom we don't hear a lot about, was really a co-laborer with Paul and a colleague of Timothy. Titus was with Paul when he was dealing with the issues at, of the church in Corinth, and, and now he is with Paul at this church in Crete. And Paul gives Titus very much the same information and instructions that he gives Timothy. However, it would appear, and then the Holy Ghost took me here, that Paul's letter to Titus is more concerned about the behavior of the people in the church more so than the governmental structure of the church, even though if you read chapter one, he also gives Titus instructions as to what the characteristics of an elder or a pastor should be and the characteristics of a deacon should be in the church. But more importantly, he deals with the divisions that are taking place in the church and how Titus ought to deal with them. Paul leaves Titus in Crete to set the church in order. And that is really the assignment of the pastor is to be the shepherd to keep things in order according to the will of God. And like some people are today, uh, the church in Crete was difficult and people have fallen to a low moral level. And those who were Christians were immature in their behavior and they had fallen lack um, concerning immorality and their basic conduct. The other issues that was a problem in this church was the whole issue of false teaching. And he writes, uh, he says, uh, he writes to Titus and to me in a sense, and he says in essence that if you're going to do this job, you, you have to preach with integrity. So my, my first point is integrity. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season, he is brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true son, in our common faith, he says, grace and peace from God the Father 
and Jesus Christ our Savior. He says in essence that there's some issues in this church. I'm in chapter 1 of Titus now. We didn't read that in your hearing, but turn to chapter 1 of Titus. It follows 2 Timothy Titus 1 verses 10 to 14. He says, there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. There were those that believed that in order to be Christian, you had to be circumcised all over again, or you had to be circumcised, because the Jewish people had a right of circumcision. And Paul preached the fact that God has no respect of circumcision or uncircumcision. What has to be circumcised is the meanness in your heart has to be cut out so that you can be that that God is calling you to be. And we've got to be very, very careful when we have people teaching in our churches who are not authorized to teach. For example, we had the back to school program. There was a woman handing out flyers outside the door as folk were coming out about the fact that um, the rapture was coming like next week. And I said to the woman, by what authority do you come into this house? to hand out information unauthorized because I am the under shepherd here under God. Now you can do whatever you want to do outside because that's taxpayers territory. But in this place, and, and, and what he says to Titus, he says that these people who are full of meaningless talk and deception, he says they must be silenced because they're disrupting the whole household by teaching things that they ought not teach. You see it there in the book. He says, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. And so in order for the church to be the church, the church must have integrity. He says in chapter 2 to Titus, you must, however, teach what is appropriate and sound doctrine. Paul is aware that in his day like today that there were different doctrines that were being preached. Um, there are those that preach that Jesus did not rise from the dead in bodily form. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, Paul um, argues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, then we are still in our sins. They deny that Jesus is the Son of God and seek after other gods. And that's why you'll hear me teach and preach that we cannot walk after the way of the Jehovah Witness or the Mormons, or the Muslims, because now are we the children of God. And it does not yet appear what it shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And he speaks to the preacher to teach people how to behave. Now he begins to deal with issues that are taking place in the church because there are these Factions. And so he deals with the men, the older men, the younger men, the older women, and the younger women. Here it is. He says, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith and in love. In other words, he says, Teach the older men, don't always fuss and find everything wrong. Don't cuss because you don't get your way. It's the grace of God that gave you what you have in the first place. And so older men need to be self-controlled. And we need to be an example for the younger men. In other words, we need to mentor younger men, take them to lunch, 
Talk with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Let them know about some of the trials and tribulations that you came through, and there's your desire that the same thing not happen to them. He says to the older women that the older women must urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children and be self-controlled and not to be slanderous in their speech to one another and to others. In other words, don't gossip so much. Don't pull people down but to take the young lady aside, spend some time nurturing her, and let her know of some of your experiences and that you don't wish for what has happened to you to happen to them because of your own experience. I mean, everybody here is an ain't that became a saint because of the grace of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the reason that you want to teach these young women is that some of us know what it is to have a whole lot of daddies and baby mama drama. It didn't just happen in 2016 and 17 and in the 21st century, but it happened when we were coming along. Some of us know what it is to have an abortion. But we're where we are, I know it got quiet. That's okay. But it's where, is this what the Lord gave me? But, it's, but we're where we are because of the grace of God and because of his mercy and because he looked beyond our faults and he saw our needs. So we want to take the young woman and we want to mentor her and teach her and love her so that the confusion that happened in our household doesn't happen in her household. I was listening this week to a sermon um, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I'm sort of getting us ready for homecoming uh, by Miles Monroe. You know, he's a young preacher, uh, prominent pastor in the Bahamas. Unfortunately, he and his family was killed in an airplane crash trying to get from one of the islands to the next one. I think they were flying from Nassau to Freeport. But, but, I, but in one of his sermons um, I, was, I, was, I was listening to the other day, he talked about the fact that um, some men don't want to come home because the sisters are always fussing. The man can never do anything right. He's got the wrong shoes. His haircut is not right. He don't smell right. He don't look right. You don't say anything good about the brother. And so therefore, he'd rather stop at the bar and hang out with his friends instead of coming home and hearing a whole lot of fussing and confusion. He says that you ought to make it so that the brother don't want to go anywhere else. You ought to say, um, honey, I appreciate all that you do. Uh, you ought to encourage him when he does something well. Thank him the fact that he is a provider. Thank him for the fact that he tries to protect and take care of his family. Uh, kiss him on the way out of the door and open up the door when he comes in. Miles Monroe says that you ought to be so kind to your husband that it's difficult for him to leave the house. He's trying to leave, but say, baby, you're just so sweet. I came back just to kiss you. He says that when he's driving his car on his way trying to get to work, you ought to be so sweet that when he thinks about you, he puts the car in reverse, drive back, say, baby, I had to come back upstairs just to give you a hug. He says, my wife is so kind to me that he don't even, he don't even see another woman. When he's another woman, she doesn't even exist. You ought to be able to hold on and take care of your business. Don't be so busy 
working in the church that you don't clean up your house you don't cook for your family because without the family we don't have a church and without the family we don't have community and so he says you older women need to teach these younger women because you've been through the same thing and if you allow your heart to be searched you know why you messed up And he says to the brothers that our assignment is to be protectors of the sisters. They are our queens and it's our job to provide a covering for them. That's why men don't have their head covered in the church because we are in the glory of God to be the protector for the woman and the woman can cover her head but the man has a responsibility of taking care of his woman. It's in the word. And so it's our job to teach the younger men how not to always harass the woman, fuss with the woman, nothing is right, the toast is burned, the eggs weren't cooked right, they made chicken, you wanted beef, but be glad that they cooked something. Preach, James. He says, in this way, we build up the body of Christ. Because if we have all these divisions within the context of the church, then the power of the Holy Ghost cannot come down because God has said in his word, I will not dwell in any unclean temple. And if we can't learn how to get along with our brothers and sisters who we see every day, how can we worship the God whom we cannot see? The ability and the manifestation of how much we love God is is attributed to how we treat one another. And so he says you, you got to teach with integrity and then you have to give instruction. So the older men are to teach the younger men and then the younger men are to walk in the instruction that they have learned. And the older women teach the younger women, and the younger women walk in the, construct, in the instruction that they have learned. It's not an either or, but we're all in this thing together. I mean, the older folk have wisdom, and the young folk have energy, and when we put it together, we can be about the business of doing God's business, and then the church becomes the body that God has called the church to be. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we ought to be respectful to everybody, but more so to those of us who are members of the household of faith. So folk who are members of the church ought not to cuss one another out. The folk who are members of the church ought not to be disrespectful to one another because out of one blood have God created all of us to dwell together in unity. And Paul says, we have to do this. Why? So that the word of God is not maligned. In other words, people can take the word of God seriously because of how we carry the word of God, not with our lips, but with our lives. Because a sermon seen is much more powerful than a sermon heard. Preach, James. So if you take your notes, got to have integrity, got to have instruction that we teach one another in love. Not everything is for an audience. Some things is between me and you if we have that kind of conversation. There are times, even this year, that I take the brothers to lunch just to talk with them about the importance of spending time in the library, the importance of being respectful, the importance of having knowledge. Because the reality of the matter 
is that sisters are getting messed up because the brothers come to college and they're doing work at the high school level and the sister's doing work at the college level and then she graduates and he just made it to the freshman year. Because nobody said to him that you need to know how to handle your business and you need to get with people who know a little bit more than you. And that's the assignment. I spend time with the sisters when we go out to have them to understand. You've got to let the brother know that you're not a KFC meal, two breasts, two thighs, and two legs, but you are a princess and a queen. And we have to get this thing together so that we become the kind of people that God has called us to be. And Paul says to his son Titus, I'm going on now to Rome. I'm leaving the church with you and I want you to fix things and set things in order. That's why the church has a pastor. A real pastor comes and he doesn't try to make you feel good, but he tries to teach us so that all of us can be the kind of people that God has called calling us to be. My final point, and I'm almost done. Finally, he says to Titus, and by extension to the people, he says, in everything, set an example by doing good in your teaching and in showing integrity in all that you do. In other words, the leader, and this hit me, has a responsibility to lead by example. I like it when somebody comes up to me every now and then, one of the seasoned saints, and says, James, you're growing. I used to be embarrassed and say, what do you mean I'm growing? I mean, I'm grown. But what they're saying is, you don't get so agitated about every little thing. Yeah, you don't, uh, you, you have to be somebody who is self-controlled, who treat people with love, who use the authority in a judicious manner. He said, you have to lead by example. You do what is right because it is the right thing to do. I mean, popularity will allow you to be in a relationship with people, but integrity will allow you to be in a relationship with yourself. Can you lay down at night knowing that you've done the best that you could to the best of your ability as a result of the grace and mercy of God? Well, James, let's bring this thing together. Well, how can we do this? How can we we be the church? How can we operate in integrity? How can we give instruction in love? How can we be people that are trustworthy? Here it is. We can only do this as a consequence and as a result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's grace and mercy. I hear Jesus declare, nevertheless I tell you, it is expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come, but when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not of me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince, meaning the devil of this world, is judge. But when the Holy Spirit, here it is, in verse 13 of John chapter 16, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but he will speak those things that the Father has given him to speak. He says to Titus, um, verses 11 to 15, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches to say um, that God is our Savior and Jesus the Christ. Let me, let me go to the book itself because this print here is, is not working right for me. Uh, let, let me just give it to you here and I'm going to let you go home. But you need to have this. Um, sometimes these, this is why you need younger people to help you. I should have got um, Kamisha to take a look at this to see if it was coming out right. Um, but that's why you still got to have a book. Let me read the book for you. It's in the book. Somebody says in the book. Here it is. 
here it is, for the grace, here it is, um, Second Titus, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It is the grace of God. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. I said, well, but God, in my shower, how do you want me to, to end this sermon? He said, James, I'll tell you how to end it. You, you go to the benediction that's found in Hebrews chapter 16, uh, and, and there you'll find the ending for this sermon. And so I'm coming home now. Somebody says, he's coming home. He said, you'll find the end now under him who brought a gain from the dead, our Lord Jesus. In other words, glory be to God who raised Jesus from the dead. Now unto him who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, the one that causes us to walk by still waters and green pastures, that great shepherd of the sheep who died on the cross for our sins, now unto him. Give God glory. Why? Because he brought a game from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. I said, what you say? What's the everlasting covenant? Well, the everlasting covenant is the promises that God has with man. The everlasting covenant became made when Jesus died on the cross. He died until the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. And before there was a curtain and only the priests could go into the holies of holies to present our sins to the Father. But when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was flipped from the top to the bottom which gives us access to the Father and we can come boldly to the throne of grace but we can find mercy to help in the time of need now unto him who brought a gain from the dead I give God glory because God loved us so much that he made a way out of no way he made a way so that we can have access to him and Jesus died on the cross giving us access to the Father. That's why when we pray, we don't pray in the name of Allah. We don't pray in the name of Buddha, but we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus because he who knew no sin became sin for us, died until death died, died until the earth started rocking and reeling, died until dead men got up from their graves, walked around Jerusalem, died until we had access to the Father. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, who is Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I thank God for his grace. I thank God for his mercy. Paul keeps on writing. He says that we're not saved by works lest anybody should boast. It's not about the fashion show. It's not about how well you sing. It's not about how good you look. But you're saved at all. It is because of the grace of God. I thank God for his grace. His grace woke me up this morning. Grace started me on my way. Grace allows me to stand here and preach because of his grace and his mercy. Paul says we are not saved by works lest any man should boast, but we're saved by the grace of God because while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us because he that knew, oh help me Holy Ghost, no sin became sin for us. Now unto him who brought a game from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. I thank him for the blood because it reaches to the highest mountain. It
goes to the Lowe's Valley and it'll never lose its power. Oh, the blood that Jesus shed for me. You've got to plead the blood of Jesus. You do know that when God had gotten upset, he was going to kill every male child. Moses says, Lord, what shall I do? He said, I'll tell you what you got to do, Moses. He says, what you got to do, this is the poor telling of Jesus the Christ. Oh, preach, James. He says, you got to get an unblemished lamb, one that's spotless, a metaphor of the Christ that was to come. And you need to take a leaf or a branch and you put it in the blood. And then you take the blood and you put it over the doorpost. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Oh, I thank God for the blood. You don't know how it is that you're here. Somebody pleaded the blood. There's still power in the blood of Jesus because it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. It'll never lose its power.